Amen. 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 say uh, give your neighbor a hug but don't we'll get kicked out of this place but I feel like we could have one of those moments yeah give your spouse a hug that's a good thing right there uh, y'all can uh, can grab a seat worship team thank you man I, uh, I missed you guys last week I did uh, our, our family was um, was down uh, doing a, a funeral service for somebody and I, I just I miss my church I love my church family I'll tell you what, well, I'm so glad you love me. I feel, I feel better that we had that moment right now. Hey, if I haven't met you, my name is Michael. I have the privilege of uh, serving as the pastor here. And I have a, a, a word. And when I say a word, I mean I've been reading through the Bible, and I believe that there's, it's profitable for every single moment. But I think particularly today, uh, there's something pretty good in this. Uh, that I'm like, some message is like, I'm like I'm just ready to share that. I gotta hold on for a second. I gotta do a little bit of housekeeping before we dive in, but I'm t- just buckle your seatbelts. Get ready for me. All right. So uh, real quick before we uh, dive into the word, uh, every single year since our church has started, so this will be our fourth year doing this. Uh, we've done in the month of January what we call a three-day breakthrough, and it's just at the beginning of the year we carve out a three-day period where we do prayer and fasting to really set ourselves up for whatever God would have during the year. And uh, as, as pastor, I have this, you know, sometimes I'm more preacher, sometimes it's more shepherd. Let me just shepherd you guys for a moment before we dive into the text. Prayer and fasting will change your life. It absolutely will. It's not the, the sexiest thing to preach on, but I'm telling you, if you get the discipline of prayer and fasting into your life, it will transform you. And so if you're looking for God to do something in your life this year, Join us for this three-day breakthrough. Now, if you don't, I'm not saying like God's going to smite you by any means. But what I am going to say is if you show up with a great expectation, I believe that God is going to meet you there. Amen? Amen. So on January 27th, 28th, and 29th, that'll be our three-day breakthrough. Uh, we have different online resources that will be sent out to you. There'll be a reading list. There'll be a prayer list. And we're also going to gather on those three days right here in this room at 6 a.m. Come on. If you're an early person, you'll love it. From 6 a.m. to 7 a.m. on those three days, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, we're going to pray and worship in here for an hour. And I would encourage you to the fullest that I can, join us for that. Something's going to happen during that time. Uh, if you're uh, an online family member of ours, we'll be streaming it as well, so we'd love for you to join us for it. But that'll be happening on the 27th, 28th, and 29th. If you want more information, head to our website, therise.church. Right on the homepage, there's a three-day breakthrough, a little spot. You can click learn more, and I would love for you to join us for that. I think I hit that pretty good. Everybody got that now? All right, let's dive into this. Um, we are in a series right now called Do It Like This, where we are looking at the Lord's Prayer. And I just want to start off reading it, and then we'll recap a little bit, and then I'll share what I, I think the Lord has for us this morning. Um, it says this in the book of Matthew, chapter 6, verse 9 through 13. We're going to do something we do occasionally here. We're all going to stand to our feet for a moment in honor of God's word. When a, when a guest walks in of honor, people rise to their feet just to show respect. I think the word of God is something that's worthy of respect. And so stand up and we're going to read this together. It'll be up on the screen. Matthew, chapter 6, verse 9 through 13. It says this. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. You can grab a seat again. Let me recap the last two weeks for you. Uh, Week one, we talked about our Father. That we have a a God in heaven who is not a removed individual. He is our father. And something happens when you have relationship with somebody. Things change, right? We talked about the difference of having relationship versus religion. Religion is regulation and rules that lead nowhere. A relationship with Jesus gives you the promise of everlasting life. We talked about that week one. We talked about how there's family rights. Like my kids, because they're my kids, they get some of the father's benefits. Like they can ride in my truck. They can live in my house. They can eat my food. Not all of it, but they can eat some of my food. Like there's privileges of them being in my house. There are privileges of us being in God's house, of being one of his kids, one of his sons, one of his daughters. That was week one. We talked about our father. Uh, Last week, 
The uh, Reverend Mike Catron, our associate pastor, who I like to call the bishop or the pope, depending on how I'm feeling, uh, because he's old and we can say that. Um, he, uh, he preached week two, which was Hallowed Be Your Name. We talk about names, how when you have a name and there's power and there's understanding that comes with that, especially if you look back traditionally, the last name was a lot of times tied to the occupation the person had, and there's authority found in names, like if you flexed your name and walked up to the White House, it may not do as much as if you, well, I was going to say Trump, but that may not go as well right now either, um, but uh, they probably should have said that, that's okay, we can edit that out. Uh, names are important and they add different power to things. And I would also say that names would say that we are associated. If we, if we know somebody's name, that means we have a relationship with them. So week two was names. This week is your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so I want to hit on this, this beginning phrase, your kingdom come. And it's easy to read. It's a lot deeper in meaning. Because if you were a part of this original audience, now we got to remember, we're reading this text right now in 2021. Anybody screw up writing 2021 yet on there? Anything? Yeah, I've done that almost every single time. We're not writing because who writes anymore? Typing. I type 2020 all the time. But 2021, if you're reading this in 2021, it has a much different context than it would if you were listening to this back when it was originally written. So, so if you were reading this originally, the people who were hearing this would have instantly thought that Jesus was referencing political reform. And they were living in a pretty tough situation. When Jesus said, your kingdom come, they're thinking, okay, kingdom that's on earth, Jesus is clearly coming to reform some of the political environments that are going on. And I just want to say, it could not be further from that when Jesus was saying this. You know, Jesus was, was not a politician, right? Uh, some, some of y'all know, he, Jesus was not a politician. He was, he was in fact, less political. He, Jesus was our, our priest. He was our high priest. He didn't come to offer social breakthroughs. He came to offer spiritual breakthroughs. Jesus' life, death, and resurrection was not an earthly political move. Jesus' life, death, and resurrection was to save sinners like me and sinners like you for the promise of everlasting life. Amen. Jesus came to set the captives free from sin and death, not law and order. I'm going to say it one more time. Jesus did not come for political reform. Right. And that is so important for us to grasp. Jesus did not come for that. But for this original group, they, they would have oftentimes thought that. Because the Israelites were underneath Roman control in that moment. And they were underneath the thumb of the Romans, and they weren't happy about it. Because the Romans could tell them how they could worship, or how they couldn't worship. Uh, the Romans would say, you have to pay taxes, and so we're going to spend the dollars this way. And if you like it, great. If you don't like it, too bad. Uh, the, the Romans would be able to say, uh, would be able to look and see what's going on. In fact, there was a lot of Romans that were spying throughout the temple and the synagogues. The Romans were all over things. And so it was affecting their faith. It was affecting their systems. It was affecting all this stuff. And so the Israelites, the people that Jesus is talking to, they were really fed up with the Romans. And so when Jesus said, my kingdom's going to come, your kingdom, they were thinking, okay, finally, we can get out from underneath the Romans. And when they heard that, I'm telling you, they're, they're, they were pumped. You ever seen a bunch of dudes get like pumped about something? Like when they show up to a football game in 20 degree weather with no shirts on painting themselves? You're like, like, well, like we don't have amen for that. Like, why do guys do that? Guys just get excited about the most random things and, and, and they rally behind it. And I can just see these guys right now where Jesus says, pray like this, your kingdom come. And they're like, yeah, we're going to do it and take on Rome. Like they were, they were probably freaking out about this. They were probably so excited and, and they were going to take on Rome because God was in it. Like Jesus was there saying there's going to be kingdom reform. And so they're like, man, God's in this. We're going to buck the whole system right now. It's going to be awesome. And they probably gave high fives and chest bumps. And I'm sure they tweeted things out back in the day as well. And it was a huge thing for them. Does that sound familiar right now? That people are using the church, religion, the gospel as a method of carrying out their political agendas. And before you think about somebody else that's guilty of doing that, why don't you check the log that's in your own eye rather than the speck that's in somebody else's? I'm telling you, 
The church, whoo! The church has had some of this going on. But like, look at, we're not going to actually look at Luke 19, but if you, if you put yourself in the moment of Luke 19, this is the triumphal entry. If you don't know much about the history of Jesus, Jesus is about to go on the cross. He's on his way into town before all of the stuff happens and they arrest him. So Jesus is on his way in, and everybody's going, yeah, this is the kingdom moment right now. This is the moment. They're all cheering. They're yelling, Hosanna. People got branches. They're waving. They're, they're actually riding in the streets. But it's peaceful. But they're in the streets doing this right now. And Jesus is coming. And they're like, yeah, this is awesome. Go, Jesus. There's like a Jesus 2020 sign in the front yard. Like, they're all about it. And Jesus gets into town. And they're all pumped about it. And what does Jesus do afterwards? He goes off by himself and weeps. Why does he do that? Why does it go to celebration to weeping so quickly? Because Jesus knew that the people that were celebrating him right then were missing the point. That it was not about a political reform. It was not about a government reform. Jesus was going to do something so much deeper and so much stronger than that. And so Jesus, after he finishes weeping, he actually makes his way into the temple and begins to clear the temple out of all the mess that's going on. And he sets up what I think is such an important Thing for us. I have great concern for the American church right now. And let me just say, I think you all hopefully know me well enough. No, I love Jesus. I, I honestly, I, I love Jesus. I know he's changed my life. The mess that I used to be is not quite as messy now. There's still a little bit of mess, still working on me. But Jesus is transforming. I love Jesus. I love Jesus' bride, the church. It's broken. It's jacked up as long as it's got people like you in it. Like, I mean, the church has got things going on. I love the church. I love the white church. I love the black church. I love the Hispanic church. I love the mixed church. I love the conservative church. I love the liberal church. I love the, the church that's closed off to the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I love the church that's a little bit hyper on the Holy Spirit. I love the church that says you have to baptize this way. I love the church that uses grape juice for communion. I love the church that uses wine for communion. I love the church. I absolutely love the church. Please, please get this. Uh, if I was going to talk to Bill for a second, and I, I'm not saying anything about Bradley right now, but I will say, Bill, your wife's got a problem. I wish she's like, yeah, I got lots of problems. Okay, welcome to the club. I, I would have great concern for your bride. I mean, I don't like her. I love her. She's awesome. We've broken bread so many times. If I have great concern, I'm going to talk about it. I'm, I have great concern for the American church right now. The church has been hijacked for political gain for far too long. I'm not just talking 2020. It's been going on for a long time. The right, the left, the middle of the road, the off the road, the whatever the new cool political title is, the church has been hijacked. And, and I think politics are important. And I, I believe that the Bible gives us different guidelines on how we should approach different political issues. and They are so important. Please vote. I hope you did. I am all about it. I have my own views. They're different from some. They're the same with the other. Like I think political um, uh, politics are important, but I want to tell you that Christ's kingdom is incomprehensibly more important. Amen. Politics are important. Christ's kingdom is incomprehensibly more important. Let me break this down politically for a second, or, or an example for you. Let's say we took this idea of different classes of people, like we've had this, this wrestle over the last year. We, we've had, it's been in our country, there's been, there's been all sorts of stuff. Let, let's go extreme for a second, and let's pretend that we're in a caste system, which still exists. If you go to India, there's parts of it where you would see this, where like, we classify people, whether it's by their skin, or their last name, or their society, or where they live. Let's say we, we, we stack people into different castes. And we say that you, because you're in this cast, you can never climb higher than this. And you're stuck in this spot, and I'm sorry, no matter how great your grandma thinks you are, or how great you really are, you will never amount to more than this because of the caste system. Let's say America turns into that, which I hope and I pray it never does. And I don't believe it ever will. But let's just pretend for a second that that's the world we're living in right now, and we say certain people are in those right now. Guess what? The gospel works. The gospel works no matter how crazy the caste system gets. Because when it comes to the cross, it is level at the cross, and the cross supersedes anything the world systems can say. And, and so when people go, Michael, aren't you sad about what's going on? I'm like, well, I am sad, but I know there's hope in Jesus. And that's really, really good news. If it got extreme, if it got worse than anything my grandparents 
could ever imagine, the gospel would still work. And I would actually argue that if you look in India, the gospel is even going forth faster than it is in America. It's almost like persecution causes things to spread. Maybe we don't want to talk about caste system for a second. Well, let's, let's talk about like, like communism. I was just talking about like everything is set, everybody gets the exact same amount of money, you get a government house, government everything, it's all set up to where it's equal for everybody, and I'll share my uh, own personal views later on that, but let's just pretend we're living in a communist country. America has become communist, which I, I hope and pray it never ever does. What happens? The gospel works! The gospel absolutely works, because while politics are important, the kingdom of Christ is incomprehensibly more important and sufficient regardless of what's going on in our world. And that, my friends, is incredible, incredible news. That's right. Christ came not to lay down the law and say it's going to be this way. Christ didn't come to say it's got to be like this, it's got to be like No, Christ came to lay down his life. Christ didn't come to stir up a bunch of things except for in the church with all the religious people. Christ came to lay down his life in love. And when he said, your kingdom come, he wasn't referencing a political agenda. He was referencing the kingdom that's going to last for all of eternity. And I'm just, I'm going to talk to myself for a moment. There's so much temptation for me to get caught up in whatever news segment is saying that a, that a particular person should take a stance on, and, and I'm done with it. Yep. I'm absolutely done with it because I know the gospel is more important than any of that other mess. And my hope and my prayer is for our church and the church that we wouldn't fall into this trap. We would not fall into the trap because social reform can lead people to hell. It really can. Like I, I'm, I'm for certain social reforms, but it's not going to get you uh, uh, Christ's salvation. No. Social reform is not going to forgive you of your sins. No. It's important, but it's nowhere near as important as the gospel is. Anybody with me right now want to say amen? Yeah. So then we get into the second part where it says, your kingdom come, your will be done. Some of you are like, oh, Michael, what's God's will for my life? Only I knew what God's will was for my life. Can I just tell you, God's will is not that complicated. It really is not that complicated. It is, it's, it, we, we just struggle to follow what it is. I'm going to give you some conversations I've never had. Um, I've never had a man come to me and say, Michael, I was on, I was on Facebook the other day, and I saw, I saw an ex-girlfriend. She had a really cute picture, and I just, I'm praying right now whether I should leave my wife. I just, I really want to know God's will. Am I supposed to abandon my marriage and embrace this relationship right here? I just, God, would you show me your will? No one, I've never had, no one's ever said to me, Michael, I, taxes are coming. I just, it might be God's will for me to lie on my taxes. I really, really think that God is leading me to be dishonest. I'm just, would you pray for me that I would figure out what this is? The problem is not that we don't understand God's will. The problem is that we refuse to walk in it sometimes. The problem is that we lack the discipline. We read things that goes in one ear, but it doesn't actually transform how we walk. God's will is not near as complicated as it sounds. Let me read to you God's will from 1 Thessalonians. Chapter 5, it says, rejoice always. Come on, find a joy no matter who's in the office. Find a joy no matter what's happening downtown. Find a joy no matter what the diagnosis is. Right. Find a joy in every single situation. Verse 17, pray without ceasing. Pray all day, every day. That doesn't mean close your eyes and walk around like this, but it means, God, would you lead me in this moment? God, would you give me grace in this moment? God, would you help me navigate this moment? God, I, I'm really struggling here. Would you give me, give me some of your power right now? Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. Oh, I could preach all of 2021 on that, but I won't right now. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus. Is for you. There's a little bit of God's will right there. Don't preach the spirit. Don't despise prophecies. But test everything. Hold fast. What is good? Abstain from uh, abstain from every evil. From from abstain from every form of evil. These are some of the things that He calls us to do. What His will is. So the question is, His will 
isn't more important to you than your will. Because Michael's selfish. Michael thinks he knows best. I'm telling you, I could give you 8,000 reasons why I'm always right. I know you all struggle to believe it. And sometimes I want to give those reasons to God. He's like, whoa, check yourself. My will, I'm God, you're not. You need to decrease, I need to increase. Like that's what he's saying in that moment. We need to check whether we're looking for his will or our will in our life. And we do that sometimes. We're praying we're like, God, would you let my will be done? If you'd only have this happen. And we, we, we get it backwards. And we've done it from the time we were a little kid. Like, like my kids are the experts of not following their father's will. I'm sure no other babies in the world are like that, but mine are. Like crayons. Why do toddlers have to peel the crayon and then snap it? I don't know. It's not on the directions, but they, like, they universally, at least mine, all four of them, know that's what you do. And I'm like, don't do that. And, they're, and they snap it. Like, don't do that. You're going to want to color with it later. They're like, no, I'm just... And then the next day... Like, Daddy, where are my crayons? I'm like, you snapped them. That's why you can't. They would just follow the Father's will. They would know what was going on. Like, they, they would just follow what God's saying. Their life would be so much better. <laughs> this is super embarrassing for my son, but he's a pastor's kid, so uh, he got cast that lot. Uh, we've told our kids not to play on the banister of our stairs. Like, it's just a bad idea. Like, don't throw things off, but don't hang on it. And uh, Ezra was up on the banister, like in the banister area, and he, he calls for uh, Erica, his mom, and goes, Mommy! Which is always so fun when they're at that age where like, they're on the edge of saying mom or mommy, and the mommy comes back out. But they said, Mommy, help me! And so this, I'm embellishing this. I wasn't there. She's telling me the story. So she walks upstairs, and he was playing on the banister. He had taken his, his pants, and he has a little drawstring, and he tied the drawstring and triple knotted it around one of the little banister things. So he's literally stuck up against the banister and saying, Mommy, help me! And how often are we like, God, would you help me? He's like, well, you tied yourself to the banister. It's your fault. If you would just follow your parents' will, life would be so much better. But kids do things like this. Adults do things like this. We walk outside with no shoes. I got a splinter. Put your shoes on. Man, I find it. My, my marriage is such a tough spot right now. Honor your vows. Oh, man, my finances are so jacked up right now. Well, why don't you get your ties straight? <clears throat> Should I keep going right now or y'all get in the picture? Like, this is what it looks like to walk in the will of God. We say, may your kingdom come, your will be done. And as the worship keeps coming back up, this is where the tension lies. We believe, and I don't mind saying that because I think we're all in this together. We believe that our vision for things is the perfect vision. That how we see things is absolutely perfect. And I want you to catch this last statement. Our lack of foresight is not an excuse for ignoring the will of God. Just because you can't see what God's doing doesn't mean he isn't doing anything. Just because you don't fully understand something doesn't mean he doesn't have a plan in it all. Just because the world is spinning in chaos doesn't mean that he's still the all-sufficient God who is in control of absolutely everything. This is what it's like to pray and walk this out. We say, God, may your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When you get that in your core, it'll transform how you respond to the issues of this world. It will absolutely transform it. And I think, I think some of us, if we were to be honest, we, we, we've looked back on the past, we'll say week, month, year, lifetime. And we go, you know, I've been following a kingdom other than Jesus' kingdom. And sure, sure there's, there's things we're, we're, we're going to call out. Like, I don't mind calling out the fact that black lives matter. I don't, I don't mind calling that out. It's, 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 a, it's a fact. Jesus died for 100% of them. 100% of them. Now, when you look at all the political things that are attached with that, like, get that out of the church. I just want to talk about lives matter to Jesus. You want to talk about uh, police reform and stuff like that? I just want to say every single officer, Jesus died for them. That's a big deal. We love the police. We love our first responders. We love our medical team. We love that stuff. We're all for peace. 
The Bible says be peacemakers, not peacekeepers and sleeping under the rug. No, be peacekeepers. So when someone's shot at the Capitol, that breaks my heart. That breaks my heart. And we're, we're, we pray for those things. We're not going to ignore them. But in all of that and all the junk that goes with it and the, the extreme polarizing opinions, what I say is I'm not about that kingdom. I'm about a higher kingdom. I'm about God coming and bringing heaven down to earth. And that's where the breakthrough is going to come through. And I encourage you to find yourself the same way and say, God, not my kingdom, not the Republican kingdom, not the Democrat kingdom, but God, may your kingdom come. Would you stand to your feet right now? Lord, may your will be done. Even when I don't see it, God, I'm going to believe it. May your will be done in my life. May your will be done in all of our lives. Before we close, here's what happens when you pray. When you pray, things change. When you pray, things change. And you want to know what the main thing that changes is? You. When you pray, it aligns you with God's will. So if there's some things going on with the will of God that you're wrestling with, it's probably a matter of perspective and alignment. And as we worship the Lord right now, I hope that's your prayer and your cry. God, would your kingdom come? Would your will be done on earth as it is in heaven? May we find ourselves being built on who you are. God, I don't want to be built on anything this world has to offer. Jesus, would you be the foundation of my life? When I agree, may you be the foundation. When I disagree, may you be the foundation. Lord, when I'm in the way, may I get out of the way of the foundation of you. Lord, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven.